ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. When he touched down in Sydney this week, India's leader received a rock star welcome. A few weeks back, Narendra Modi became the leader of the most populous nation in the world after India surpassed China for the title. Now he wants to transform India's economy into a global superpower to rival Beijing. Today, a fellow at the Australia India Institute, Pradeep Taneja, on the two faces of Prime Minister Modi, why despite his chequered human rights record, nations like Australia can't resist him. Pradeep, Narendra Modi, he arrived in Sydney and, oh my gosh, what a welcome. Namaste, Australia. It was quite something. (laughs) Well, he has a lot of fans in Australia amongst the Indian diaspora. He is a very popular politician in India. And it's not surprising that so many Indians turned up, not just from Sydney, but also from Victoria and other states at the stadium in Sydney to listen to uh, Prime Minister Modi. The historic relationship of India and Australia is bigger than all of this. And Anthony Albanese noted, it seems the Indian leader is more popular than Bruce Springsteen even. (laughs) Prime Minister Modi is the boss. It was quite quite the welcome. (laughs) Except Anthony Albanese's reference to the boss was lost on most uh, Indians. I said to my friend, the Prime Minister, before the last time I saw someone on the stage here was Bruce Springsteen, and he didn't get the welcome that Prime Minister Modi has got. Because most Indians in the audience there or in India would not actually connect Bruce Springsteen (laughs) to the boss. Uh, and, And therefore, I think in India, it's being taken literally as meaning, as Prime Minister Albanese of Australia was saying that Modi is actually the boss. <laughs> the boss of Australia as well? Yeah. <laughs> well, whatever that means. OK. Well, I want to look with you now at why it is that Narendra Modi is so popular. What does the community see in him? What do they like about him? Well, Prime Minister Modi has assiduously cultivated an image of a leader, of a man who is a man of development. He is a doer. He gets things done. And that's the image he cultivated when he was the chief minister of the western Indian state of Gujarat. Mm-hmm. And in Gujarat, he, he became famous for bringing, you know, regular electricity. In, in many states in India, electricity supply is not very regular. And he created a private grid to provide electricity. So he cultivated this image of a leader who is pro-business, who is pro-industry and pro-development. In fact, he was referred to as Vikas Purush, which means the man of development. Mm. And he took that image to the federal elections in 2014. And he won that election as a member of parliament. And he had already been chosen by his party as the prime ministerial candidate. So he became prime minister. Over the next couple of days, Narendra Modi is taking a victory lap across northern India. Here in New Delhi, large parts of the city have had to be shut down for Mr Modi's visit. He's expected to be sworn in as India's Prime Minister on Wednesday. And he's worked on this image. He's cultivated that image as Prime Minister, that he's a man who gets things done. And he's taking India forward. And he has enhanced India's stature in the international community.
I do see that his approval rating at home is around 78%. I guess most world leaders would only dream of something like that. But there is a flip side to him, isn't there? Because while thousands of people turned out here to greet him, he's really polarising. And there were protests here too. There were apparently some posters put up declaring him a Hindu terrorist. Tell me about that side of Narendra Modi. Yeah, I mean, he is a popular politician. He's won two consecutive elections. He's probably going to win the next election, which is less than 12 months away now. Mm -hmm. But he's also a controversial figure. There has been an erosion of civil liberties since he came to office. And and that's something which has been witnessed in terms of uh, raids on media organizations, raids against uh, think tanks, uh, some of the think tanks in India. So there is also that other image of Prime Minister Modi as someone under whose leadership there has been an erosion of civil liberties in India. There is also, of course, concern that his sort of nationalist message, it's pitted Hindus against Muslims. And you mentioned his time leading Gujarat as the chief minister of Gujarat. And of course, that's when the riots happened there in 2002. Mob justice is ruling the streets of Gujarat. Youths are rampaging through the western state's commercial capital, Ahmedabad, torching Muslim homes, businesses and even mosques. There, there is certainly controversy about him and he is he's also very, very open in terms of his religiosity and Hindu ideology, Hindutva ideology, the ideology which essentially says that India, Indian identity and Hindu identity are basically the same thing. Uh, and that's a controversial thing to do in a country which is officially, constitutionally, is a secular country. I can see he's even gone to the extent of rewriting textbooks. A school in India funded by Hindu nationalists. Their influence has grown since Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to power. His party, the BJP, rewriting school books to the disadvantage of minorities. Well, there has been exactly that they are going to excise the Mughal history, the almost the history of 300 years of India before the British mm. came to India, that that history would be excluded from the history textbooks for high school children. Let's have a look, Pradeep, at the fact that he is now, and very recently actually, governing the most populous nation in the world. There are now 1.41 billion people in India. It's overtaking China to become the most populated nation on Earth. How significant is that, do you think? Well, it's significant in the, in the demographic sense. I mean, India's population was growing faster than China because China had for a long time pursued this you know, very repressive one-child policy. So India now has you know, nearly 500 million people working age, young people below the age of, I think, 35. Mm. And the challenge for the Indian government is to skill them up so that this demographic dividend becomes a financial dividend for the economy. Mm, okay, it's worth noting, I think, that there are something like 900 million registered voters in India. That's more than the population of the US and Europe combined. So huge, huge numbers. It seems pretty clear that the US is hopeful that India could be the country to rival China in Asia. Do you think that's possible? Well, in, in economic terms, there is still a huge gap between India and China. Mm -hmm. I mean, India's per capita GDP is about one-fifth that of China. I mean, only 40 years ago when China began its, you know, open-door policy in the late 1970s, India and China had almost equivalent per capita GDP. But China's per capita GDP today is five times that of India. China's military spending is more than four times that of India. So India still has a long way to go, but India at the moment is growing faster than China. In fact, it is the world's fastest growing major economy. So it does have uh, most of the ingredients for, for success. What about its relationship with nations like Russia, nations like China? We can see that Modi, he hasn't condemned the war in Ukraine, for instance. 
Well, India's relationship with Russia and China are two very different mm-hmm. relationships. With China, of course, India has a long border, a three and a half thousand kilometer long border, where we have seen in recent years skirmishes on the border. The border situation is quite tense at the moment. The Indian government confirmed 20 of its soldiers were killed in the clash along the disputed Indian-China border. The death toll on the Chinese side remains unclear, with authorities there underplaying the issue. And overall, India's relationship with China has deteriorated over the past few years. Whereas with Russia, India has had a long-term friendly relationship. Soviet Union has been the key supplier of military hardware to the Indian military. And Russia has continued to do that. So India has continued to buy military hardware from Russia. Russia continues to remain an important and a diplomatic and military partner for India. That's interesting. And you mentioned also the decline in civil liberties of the freedom of press in India under Narendra Modi's rule. Can Australia really cosy up to India when democratically it's going backwards? I can see that was the sort of question that the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was asked during an interview on Channel 7. He seems a, a bit of a tyrant. It's not up to me to pass a, a, a comment on some of the internal politics in, in India. I don't it's think the, the Western world, when we look at the United States, the European Union, when it comes to dealing with the challenge of China, I don't think they have a choice. Mm. There is no other country in the world. There's no other country in the Indo-Pacific with the heft of India with the size of India, with the population of India, and with the economic potential Mm. of India. Mm. So they really don't have a choice. And that's why the Prime Minister Modi's government finds itself in a position that it can can take a stand on Ukraine, for example, uh, which is quite different from the position taken by most of India's interlocutors. Uh, India uh, India can defy criticism when it comes to erosion of civil liberties in India. Because the government of India knows that India has become almost indispensable to the United States. Mm, So, Pradeep, do you think the relationship between Australia and India could become more important than the relationship Australia has with China? It is certainly possible. In fact, I think that is likely to be uh, the the trajectory of the Australia-India relationship. As long as they stay focused on a market-friendly approach to economic development, there is no reason why India cannot match China uh, in terms of its economic heft. And if that is the case, then I think India will become an even more important partner for Australia. Pradeep Taneja is a senior lecturer in Asian politics at the University of Melbourne and an academic fellow at the Australia India Institute. The US leader, Joe Biden, will host Narendra Modi for an official state visit next month as the US works to deepen its ties with India. During his visit to Sydney, the Indian leader and Anthony Albanese signed a deal on green hydrogen. We looked at whether Australia could become a green hydrogen superpower this week. That's also in your feet. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Veronica App App and Sam Dunn, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. I'm Sam Hawley. You can find all our episodes of the podcast on the ABC Listen app. Thanks for listening.